So I think uh, we'll make a start, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on uh, drug-coated balloon technology. It's great to see, I don't know if it's renewed interest in the technology, but it's great to have a, a very full room at this stage of the day. My name is Robert Byrne. I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, from Munich in Germany. I'm, I'm delighted to co-chair this session with uh, Bruno Scheller. Um, it's, I think, going to be uh, a very interesting uh, session, including some, some new data and some updates. And uh, we're looking forward very much to having time for discussion uh, with you. And we appeal again to all speakers that uh, we'll do our best to, keep, to stay on time so that we have time for your questions. And with that, I'll hand over to Bruno, who's going to introduce the objectives of the session. Yeah, Rob, thank you very much. Um, I would like to have the slides first, please. Can we have the slides? Oh, okay. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> um, but this is another session here. Uh, uh, bottom left, Bruno. Bottom this left uh, arrow, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. one. And then here we are. Perfect. Okay. Okay, it's a pleasure also to be here. And um, um, I was asked um, to give a short statement on the on the um, discussion about safety of public toxicity devices in peripheral arteries. Um, and uh, this relates to this uh, uh, meta-analysis by Katsanos uh, published uh, last December, uh, where they found no um, difference in mortality for uh, Pactitaxial coated devices in the superficial femoral artery at one year, but um, uh, surprisingly at two and five years there was a signal towards higher mortality. Um, I wanted only to point out shortly on the limitations of this meta analysis, there was clearly selection bias. If you look, those trials selected for two years follow up already had a higher mortality at one year, and those with lower mortality were not selected for the longer follow up. And um, at the five years data, there were severe. Uh, flaws with the, the counting method they, they use. And uh, this is all no patient level data, and I think this is the key um, for a better understanding of what, what happened. Some of the ongoing discussions is, is Pactitaxel cytotoxic? Uh, Serolim is not, yes or no. Um, this is um, very elegant work from uh, the Munich group years ago published, looking at um, cytotoxicity depending on the concentration of paclitaxel. Uh, and as you can see, um, the, the cytotoxic effect starts at concentration of 100 nanogram per milliliter and above. And if you look at the tissue concentrations of uh, different DCB, uh, we do not reach this 100 milligram or nanogram per milligram um, uh, uh, at the first burst. And after uh, one day, the levels are in the area where there's no cytotoxicity of Pactitaxel compared to the Cerolimus. And if you look at the question of the therapeutic window, systemic treatment with Pactitaxel for cancer therapy is roughly 300 milligram per day. And the local treatment with coronary DCB uh, is clearly less than one milligram. So this is a so-called therapeutic window uh, of the factor uh, more than 700 and for peripheral artery disease, uh, it's, uh, the relationship is uh, about uh, 55. This is, by the way, not the case for serolimus, where systemic treatment is much lower. Um, the this current safety discussions, discussion about peripheral devices reminds uh, very well uh, to the so-called ESC firestorm in 2006, uh, where the question was arised if drug eluting stents coronary increase uh, mortality. Um, and there were two meta-analyses presented at this time. The, the first one by uh, Eduardo Kamsind and colleagues um, used the same methodology as the Katsanos, published events divided by the intention to treat number of patients, not looking at uh, crossover, not looking at, at loss to follow-up. And they interestingly find a sign uh, of death and myocardial infarction against uh, serolimus eluting stent, but not against Pactitaxel eluting stents. And the second meta-analysis, also using this methodology, uh, looked uh, at the difference between cardiac and non-cardiac mortality, and they found um, an increase in non-cardiac mortality at two years solely uh, for the eluting stents, with no explanation of the mechanism of action. 
And the next step, what happened was that there were uh, uh, warning letters by the FDA, uh, a panel meeting by the FDA, and so on. And finally, there were, um, were uh, an effort to do patient level meta analysis like this one, again from the Munich group, um, and showing that there was no difference at all in mortality uh, between, between serolimus salutic stents and uh, the metal stents. So, this is uh, very similar to what happened and maybe will happen. By the way, for um, the Paclitax scale coated stents, there has never been uh, a mortality sign compared to bare metal stents. Uh, with respect to coronary Paclitaxel uh, eluting stents, uh, we uh, heard last year about the uh, Daedalus uh, project. This is a patient level meta analysis, again by, by Robert's group, um, uh, looking at if the efficacy in terms of uh, target lesion reintervention and safety endpoints, and this is a combined safety endpoint of death myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis. And there was no significant, but at least a trend towards lower event rates with paclitaxel coated balloons. So this means there is no safety signs in the coronary arteries. And this is also part of the uh, PCR statement from yesterday from Alexandra Lansky, pointing to the fact that coronary DCB are not associated with a long-term safety signal. Um, and uh, this means also that um, at the moment, even for the peripheral uh, uh, disease, paclitaxel coated balloons are still uh, in use and should be used uh, if appropriate. Um, coming now to the uh, topic of the uh, today's sessions, um, DCB only in uh, de novo coronary artery disease. This is the uh, SCAR registry data uh, showing that uh, DCB only against current generation drug eluting stents show similar rates of target lesion uh, reverse colorization up to five years with the benefit of DCB having a uh, much lower um, uh, vessel thrombosis rate compared to drug eluting stent thrombosis. And this leads us to the uh, principal uh, concept of DCB only. Uh, we have to start with lesion preparation, um, and after your lesion preparation, you can decide if you uh, do implant uh, stand or can use the DCB without uh, stand implantation. Um, and we will start uh, after my talk with, with Robert's presentation on lesion preparation, after what's followed by uh, Rabanigas' uh, uh, newest data on the basket small 2 trial. Um, Thomas Rizan will um, give some overview on DCB only trials in larger coronary vessels. And uh, finally, Franz Kleber will um, report of the lumen enlargement we see with uh, DCB only application. Um, and now it's my pleasure to. Uh, and, and finally, Simon's last word, of course, is, uh, is the most important. Um, and it's a pleasure now to uh, hand over to uh, Robert for his presentation. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Bruno, for the introduction. And uh, it's great to be part of a, a session like this with uh, some of the key people in the development of the technology. And we also have uh, Simon and Franz as panelists, who I didn't introduce at the start, who have uh, great experience uh, with these devices. So uh, my topic is lesion uh, preparation, is dissection uh, what we fear, and uh, I hope to uh, take you through in the next 10-12 uh, minutes uh, some of the issues around uh, lesion preparation. Um, I think almost this is uh, probably the central message uh, for drug-coated balloon therapy and one that of course uh, may seem obvious but bears repeating and that's that uh, drug-coated balloon is a local drug delivery device. This is uh, how we apply a medication after we have done the job of dilating the lesion or dilating the instant restenosis with whatever uh, device is necessary to achieve a satisfactory dilatation. Um, the methods that are available to us for device uh, for stenosis dilatation are, of course, uh, well known, and I've just mentioned them very briefly. Of course, standard semi-compliant uh, semi -compliant balloon angioplasty catheters, uh, which typically uh, have their nominal diameter at six to eight bars, or non-compliant -compli balloons, which we frequently require for uh, fibrocalcific lesions and instant restenosis. Of course, super high-pressure balloons allowing pressure up to 55 bar are increasing increasingly common in cath labs in uh, Europe, and this is an important part of our daily uh, routine when we have lesions that are difficult to dilate. 
Scoring uh, and cutting balloons, of course, are the next uh, category of uh, presentation. And here, at least in our uh, experience, uh, we have uh, three devices on the Catalab uh, shelf, uh, all of which are based on uh, scoring elements uh, rather than uh, true uh, cutting balloons, ranging from uh, the angioscope to the NSA Alpha and uh, to the uh, score of flex uh, scoring balloon catheter. And of course, uh, we still have in our cath lab, and it's an important part, even uh, for drug-coated balloon uh, therapy, is uh, lesion preparation with rota rotational atherectomy, which perhaps uh, you can see from this table from the uh, EAPCI consensus document and rotablation that there's quite variable use. Uh, and Simon and his colleagues are at the top of the table there. And uh, Bruno and Franz and the rest of us are down the bottom of the table when it comes to rotablation use, or at least that was the state in 2015. And finally, of course, many of you will have heard uh, recently a little bit more about uh, lithotripsy as a uh, method for uh, dealing with uh, non-dilatable lesions or heavily fibrocalcific calcific lesions, and also as part of the DCB uh, debate, perhaps a useful uh, lesion preparation strategy before drug-coated balloon angioplasty in patients uh, with instant restenosis, for example, due to chronically underexpanded stents. I think uh, there are some data sets that merging on that, and we will see more data in the course of the year on that. So I wanted to uh, uh, consider now uh, two areas, instant restenosis and de novo disease, and talk about lesion preparation and, uh, and uh, dissection. And uh, you've seen this already, but this is the consensus document from Franz that Bruno uh, showed. And in instant restenosis, we're avid, uh, advised to uh, predilate with a balloon to vessel ratio of uh, 0 0.8 to 1.0. And of course, we escalate to uh, additional techniques that I just mentioned, including super high pressure balloon, cutting scoring balloon, <laughs> Uh, as uh, as necessary and maybe lithotripsy uh, in 2019 and uh, then we decide uh, based on the uh, type of uh, dissection that we have is there a residual dissection of A or B A uh, and B just being defined as luminal haziness or a, a linear dissection and if it's A and B and we're happy that we've got Timmy 3 flow and residual stenosis less than 30 we can go for a DCB and if we've got a dissection of C or phi, uh, C to F including um, extravasation, spiral dissection, intraluminal filling defect and complete occlusion, then we need to consider an alternative strategy with stent implantation. So here's uh, a case just to give you a flavor of a patient with a right coronary artery, moderate uh, to severe uh, instant uh, restenosis in the mediodistal area. And uh, this was a case that was dilated with a 3.5 non-compliant uh, balloon. And a slight waste you'll see still uh, in the balloon, but uh, with a balloon to vessel ratio of 0 0.8 to 1.0, uh, we were happy with the uh, lesion uh, preparation and decided to proceed uh, with a 3.5 uh, paclitaxel uh, coated balloon at 14 atmospheres. And at least our practice is that if the patient tolerates it, we do uh, uh, leave the balloon up for 60 seconds and in a distal right, that's normally not a problem. Uh, otherwise, we will do two 30-second dilatations. Uh, but we believe in um, investing time to get a, a, an optimal result uh, with uh, DCB angioplasty. The balloons are fragile. The coatings are fragile. We know if we look at them under microscope uh, that uh, we need to handle these with care on the table and also bring them to the lesion in as rapid a manner as uh, possible to ensure that as little medication is lost uh, getting to the lesion as possible. Uh, you can see here then a satisfactory angiographic uh, result in uh, two projections. And I wanted to show you then the uh, uh, OCT uh, just to make the point that uh, when you work with a, with a drug-coated balloon angioplasty, then I think uh, you learn to accept uh, a result that is perhaps uh, less than uh, optimal. And uh, you can see here that we have considerable disruption of the knee intimal hyperplasia that caused this uh, instant uh, restenosis. But of course, this is something Something that we generally like to see uh, after drug coated balloon angioplasty and uh, we are, are happy with. And this patient came back for surveillance uh, angiography at six months and I think uh, you can see that the drug coated balloon did a good job. Um, in terms of uh, lesion preparation, I mentioned uh, scoring balloon uh, catheters, and uh, that was uh, used in lesion preparation uh, in this case. And I wanted, uh, it, in this case that's coming up, and I wanted to uh, 
uh, make the point uh, that uh, after scoring and cutting uh, balloon dilatation, of course, you can also see substantial disruption of the neo intima and substantial uh, dissection. And here is a patient with a uh, instant uh, restenosis uh, in the proximal circumflex, if I remember correctly, and you can see quite high signal, heterogeneous high signal intensity in the uh, OCT. Um, after uh, performing a, a, a scoring balloon and a drug-coated balloon uh, angioplasty, you see very nice uh, tears into the neo intima, um, and the neo intima has really been compressed and uh, pushed back. And we think uh, that the scoring uh, elements are important not only in preparing the lesion, but they may facilitate then entry of the paclitaxel uh, into the vessel and uh, improve its efficacy. Uh, we think this is uh, clinically meaningful for patients based on a randomized study that we did at our institution called Isodesire 4, where we randomized patients to either having the lesion prepared with scoring balloon or with regular balloon angioplasty. And you could see a small, but in these uh, patients, particularly in the patients in this part of the curve who are particularly higher risk, uh, a benefit over the uh, regular balloon uh, preparation in terms of the efficacy of the DCB angioplasty procedure. So uh, moving then to uh, take a, a look at uh, de novo disease, and here if we look at the uh, consensus paper from uh, 2013, we can see for uh, de novo or small vessel coronary disease, and we're going to hear more about this in the next presentation, that the recommendations for predilatation are actually quite similar in terms of choosing a balloon to vessel ratio of 0 0.8 to 1.0, uh, escalating as required in terms of super high pressure balloon, uh, uh, regular non-compliant cutting scoring, rotablation, or as I mentioned, lithotripsy in 2019. And then again, looking at the simil similar uh, characteristics, do I have only a type A or B dissection? Do I have TIMI3 flow? And do I have a residual stenosis of less than 30%? And those being the case, you proceed to DCB angioplasty. And again, if we have high degree of uh, dissection with extravasation, linear dissection, uh, or spiral dissection, filling defect, or complete occlusion, then we need to uh, consider additional strategies to uh, um, implanting uh, a stent uh, I, and uh, typically uh, a drug eluting stent. Uh, this is a paper from uh, Bernardo uh, Cortese uh, showing their experience of DCB uh, only angioplasty and focusing just on the uh, element of dissection and they provide some representative cases of a patient with a uh, type uh, C dissection uh, which uh, they actually left uh, according to their protocol and this resulted in a uh, very good result actually at a follow up as you see on the left of the picture and here a uh, long uh, hazy dissection in the LAD which they also left and uh, you can see at uh, angiographic uh, follow-up uh, a very satisfactory appearance in the long diffuse uh, treated disease segment. They also then split their analysis into a uh, non-dissection cohort which is in red and a dissection cohort in green and of course this is a relatively modest uh, sample size but it shows that they didn't see any clear adverse signal in terms of MACE, MI or TLR between the uh, non-dissection and the dissection uh, cohort. They also looked in a little bit more detail and presented their uh, angiographic follow-up in a subset of patients, and you can see here they had very nice uh, results in terms of late luminal loss of 0.14, and uh, they presented an interesting figure showing you the fate of patients who had a dissection, and as I said, they included types A to type C as dissections that they weren't going to do anything about, and uh, you can see that the fate of most of these dissections is indeed uh, benign healing, and uh, you can uh, see here very nicely that the majority of patients um, uh, at a baseline had a, a type B uh, linear type of uh, dissection and a minority had uh, a, um, a type A or a type C dissection but at uh, follow-up then of this uh, collective of 48 patients 45 were adjudicated to have uh, satisfactory healing and a benign fate. Now it stands to reason, and this is uh, some uh, images that I got from my colleague uh, Michael Yoner, who's a cardiologist and also a pathologist, and uh, it stands to re reason that of course uh, the fate of all dissections is not uh, the same, and uh, the cases in uh, the Cortese paper were of course selected cases which were felt to have benign features, and you can clearly imagine that dissections with a small intimal tear, as in illustrated here in this pathology specimen on the left side, have quite a different 
different fate from uh, dissections which have major medial dissection with hemorrhage and um, I think our job as clinicians is obviously to sort out the two which is sometimes quite easy and you can tell that from the angiographic appearance and from the classification system A to F um, uh, which dissections are benign and which require uh, further treatment but of course uh, one unexplored issue is the uh, role of intravascular imaging and helping you to sort out uh, two examples which are less different from each other than these uh, two examples. You can see in um, uh, Rabin's trial uh, also um, how frequently uh, uh, cases arise where they weren't uh, uh, able to uh, proceed with randomization to DCB or DES just to give you a feel and he'll probably go into this uh, in more detail but you can see I think I calculated that they had 14% of patients who had uh, required who had flow limiting a dissection or a resi residual stenosis so you can see the vast majority of patients that they considered for inclusion would have gone down the left side of this treatment algorithm and only a minority go to the right. And nevertheless, it is important uh, to realize that the patients who subsequently have a DCB uh, and are deemed to have uh, a result that's not acceptable and require additional stent implantation, I think one of the other things we saw in, uh, in his paper uh, was that these patients tended to have uh, inferior outcomes compared to the patients who had undergone uh, straightforward successful DCB angioplasty or uh, stenting with current uh, generation uh, uh, high performance drug eluting stents. So, in terms of take home messages, I think is dissection what we f what we fear. Well, I think uh, it's definitely a two sided coin, and thorough lesion preparation and meticulous attention to angioplasty uh, detail and uh, is is a prerequisite for doing drug coated balloon angioplasty. Lesions not amenable to preparation with standard PTCA catheters should have adjunctive uh, uh, modalities, and these should be liberally used to achieve a satisfactory result prior to applying medication with DCB. Modified uh, balloon angioplasty with scoring cutting balloons, I think have additional benefit not just in facilitating plaque disruption but in providing uh, controlled dissection planes to enable the drug to get better into the tissue and these may enhance DCP efficacy, at least that was our experience in ICER Desire for a randomized trial. Flow limiting dissections you saw occur in a minority uh, of cases and they should be treated with uh, bailout stenting and non-flow limiting dissections, I think you get a feel from them from the Cortese uh, paper, occur relatively frequently and seem to be associated with a benign course. So that's my take home slide, uh, DCB uh, as a last therapy after lesion uh, preparation and the devices are fragile and should be handled uh, with care and meticulous uh, angioplasty technique is critical. Thank you. Thank you, great presentation. Are there questions from the audience? Um, I would like to start with two questions. Number one, do you think that uh, we should use routinely um, scoring or cutting balloons for lesion preparation or, or do you see a different patient group where we should do this and, and not, not necessarily do it? I mean, I must say we're definitely using them more liberally, um, partly because of our experiences in ICER Desire 4, where we use them systematically and uh, saw uh, some evidence of uh, benefit. But certainly in the higher risk patients, this small efficacy advantage in DCB angioplasty might be critical, because these are patients who are teetering on the brink of a restenosis. So um, although the benefit that we saw in our randomized trial was small, we've taken to uh, systematically using uh, scoring balloons uh, for for uh, instant restenosis, but also more and more for de novo disease. Uh, we see additional advantages in preventing melon seeding, slippage, and uh, before escalating to rotablation, I think we, in fibrocalcific lesions that are difficult to rotablate, we will typically do, uh, try scoring uh, balloon angioplasty first, and often uh, we, we come away without requiring rotablation, though we are also quite liberal in switching to rotablation if it's necessary. And second question, you mentioned uh, additional imaging, uh, which, which imaging and when, and what is the role of FFR in this context? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's unrealistic uh, to think that we're going to use uh, imaging in a very high proportion of our case cases, because in most countries in Europe where we work, we have uh, significant cost considerations uh, in addition uh, to uh, uh, c considerations in relation to procedure time at the same time, particularly with DCP angioplasty, it's important to achieve uh, a, a, 
an excellent upfront result and um, I think this is one of the things that I'm sure we can hear the experience of uh, Simon and Franz and uh, other people who have uh, a lot of uh, of experience in everyday practice. I think we do do intravascular imaging in stent failure uh, when the stent failure cause is not obvious. So we are liberal in our use of intravascular imaging and the, which one? We use OCT. Uh, you can, uh, of course, use IVUS if you have IVUS, but uh, we tend to uh, liberally use OCT. And in de novo disease, I must say, we have taken uh, now to doing much more uh, OCT imaging in long, complex fibrocalcific uh, lesions. We find investing the time at the start allows you to better plan the procedure, and, um, uh, and, and this often uh, makes it a more efficient uh, procedure. So I think... Uh, fibrocalcific uh, complex uh, lesions, left main, uh, certainly uh, liberal use of left main in line with uh, guidelines, and there, of course, more IVUS than OCT, although still a high proportion of OCT, and for evaluation of uh, stent failure, at least that's our practice. And FFR, do you think, do you think it's helpful, FFR, to, to uh, judge the quality of your lesion preparation? Does it make sense? I mean, uh, I certainly think uh, FF4 is useful, as we all know, in the evaluation of intermediate stenosis. So 40 to 80 percent uh, lesions at uh, baseline is the recommendation in the guidelines uh, for intermediate stenosis where you don't have evidence of ischemia, and that's what we do in our clinical practice, high-grade stenosis. We don't do FF4 on instant restenosis. Uh, and you saw some cases there where sometimes you have moderate to high grade uh, restenosis. I think FF4 is important to ev evaluate those lesions to, uh, so that you have the indication. In terms of using it then after your lesion preparation to say, well, is this good enough to leave alone? I don't think it's so helpful because I think you need to be guided by these dissection factors and the FF4 uh, value might not uh, reflect those parameters that you see on angiography. So I know people are doing it, uh, but it's not something uh, that I've incorporated in our practice. Okay, great. Any questions? Yeah. So we have a microphone here. Thank you for a nice presentation. What do you think about not to intimal but medial dissection without hematoma and without flow limitation? What do we think of deep new intimal dissection, is it? Not to intimal but medial. To medial, yeah. Medial dissection without hematoma and without flow limitation. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, where you have disruption of the external elastic lamina and uh, you're uh, getting into uh, medial disruption, I, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's a trickier one to, to leave alone. Often, I suppose, you will have angiographic features which make you concerned in terms of flow. If you don't have those features and the flow is still good, uh, I guess people will have experience with leaving them alone. And I would tend to uh, stent them even without a hematoma if, you're sh if you have very substantial disruption. I'm sure other people would see that differently, uh, but there's probably no black and white answer. I don't know. Bruno, do you have an answer for that one? No, not, not really. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank, you. thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you very much again. Um, we come to the next talk by uh, Raba Niga from Basel in Switzerland. Um, and I think we will get some new additional data to the basket small to try. Thank you, Bruno. Um, my name is Raba Niga. I'm an interventional cardiologist from uh, Basel in Switzerland. And my task today is uh, to, to, uh, to guide you through the, the journey of the drug coated balloons in small coronary artery disease. Um, the whole journey started with the PEPCAT-1 trial. This was a single-arm study where the sequent please drug the balloon was used in small coronary vessels. And they had an excellent uh, record here of um, a, a combined clinical endpoint of 6.1% uh, after one year. And this was a really good result. However, when they uh, combined the drug coated balloon with a bare metal stent, the rates were much higher here at almost 40% of, uh, of uh, uh, clinical events. These were bare metal stents used. 
But the reassuring thing was that the, the drug coated balloon, when the, it was used uh, only or alone, had a really good long term um, follow up. The next study here um, was the Bello trial was a randomized trial where they compared the drug coated balloon uh, against a drug eluting stent. It was a first generation paclitaxel eluting stent, the Taxus Liberty. And it was um, a different drug coated balloon, the impact. Um, as well, um, they, they uh, used this, uh, these devices in small coronary vessels, and they found in an angiographic endpoint a very good result for the drug coated balloon. Um, however, used against the first generation Paclitaxel eluting stent, but it was um, highly significantly better. The problem here was that the Event rates um, were low, but um, in a in a very small or in a almost in a, in a rather small trial, uh, it was not significant. You see here that at uh, 30 days the event rates were very low. The maze rate of 2.2 and 4.3 uh, uh, um, was very low. After um, the interventional um, control or the angiographic control, the event rates were, of course, much higher. But this were, was not sufficient to, to, to say anything about the value of drug coated balloons in small vessel disease. Um, there was another trial from China where the Restore drug coated balloon was used against the modern second generation uh, stent. This trial was published last year and it was um, as well an angiographic trial uh, powered for non inferiority. You see here, these were the results, the angiographic results. They started here uh, with this and then went over to these two and at the end ended up with these results, the red one is um, always the drug coated balloon and the blue one is the stent. And this trial reached non-inferiority, so both devices had uh, the same effect angiographically here. Um, the clinical events, they were low, but um, again, were not uh, different uh, because of the sample size or you cannot tell anything because the sample size was a little bit limited. And because of all this, uh, this, this good signals here for the drug coated balloons, but uh, without conclusive clinical data, uh, we did the basket small 2 trial, which was uh, published uh, last year. You have seen this patient flow chart already. Um, we enrolled 883 patients, and it was mandatory to perform a uh, proper pre-dilatation of these lesions. Uh, pre-dilatation means um, absence of flow limit, uh, limiting dissections and no residual stenosis of more than 30%. And um, if this pre-dilatation was successful, patients could be randomized in the one of two groups. We had the sequent please drug coated balloon and two second generation stents here, the Paclitaxel um, eluting second generation uh, stent and the science stent. Uh, we started with the taxis stent and had to switch after one quarter of the patients to the science stent because the taxis was not available anymore in, in Germany. The primary endpoint was clinical one, um, MACE for cardiac death, non-fatal MI and target vessel revascularization after one year. The sample size 758 patients and this was the primary endpoint. We reached non-inferiority. You see here both curves are literally the same. Um, the MACE rate was at about 7.5% in both groups and highly significant for non-inferiority. This MACE rate was consisting of cardiac death that was a little bit higher in the in the balloon group, non-fatal MI was a little bit lower in the balloon group, and target vessel revascularization, again, a little bit lower in the balloon group, but all of these three um, components of the um, clinical endpoints were, were not statistically, statistically significant. When we look at the different devices or combination of devices, you can see here easily that 
um, some of these combinations or devices were uh, not really working very properly. The combination here of drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents, the bailout situation, had quite high event rates. I think these were just the problematic patients with a worse outcome. The tax stent here in light, light blue had higher event rates, not that bad as expected, but higher event rates. Um, and uh, very reassuring here, the truck coated balloon only group in red and the taxes stand group, they were performing um, equally in these two groups. So this was, um, this was the, the, the proof for, for us that uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, strategy is working well. Another important point is that major bleeding rates uh, could be reduced with the truck coated balloon strategy, not uh, statistically significant, but uh, with, a, with a good hazard rate uh, ratio of uh, 0.45. Um, you might know that the truck coated balloon needs only four weeks of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy or even less, and the, the drug eluding stents here, they were um, treated for six or 12 months with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy according to the, the guidelines at the moment of uh, the study enrollment. Um, yesterday, um, I, I was able to, 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 uh, uh, to tell about the angiographic analysis we did. Um, this is very important to understand what happens in these, um, in these uh, vessels. For you to know, this angiographic analysis was performed in the subgroup of patients that had a clinically indicated reangiography. So this was not a, a planned reangiography of everybody. It was a, a clinically indicated reangiography in about 13 percent of uh, of patients, and this is um, um, probably a selection of the worst cases that had events. In this angiographic uh, analysis, uh, we saw the following. Um, after the, uh, before uh, the, the uh, intervention, we had similar results in both groups. And immediately after the intervention, we had much better results in the drug eluting stent group. This is clear. You reach a stent-like result only when you put in a stent. This is clear. In the drug coated balloon group, um, the minimal lumen diameter was smaller uh, as well as the acute gain and the residual uh, diameter stenosis was a bit higher. Um, during follow-up, we saw that um, things were getting a little bit better in the drug coated balloon group. Um, uh, still, the minimal diameter was, um, uh, was, uh, was larger in the DES group as was the, the net gain. But uh, the diameter stenosis was getting better. Um, the drug coated balloon, they, they had only a plus of about 7% and the drug eluting stent of about 10% regarding diameter stenosis. This is the difference between the post um, intervention and the follow up angiography. And um, you see here that the late lumen loss in, uh, in, in the two uh, treatment groups was uh, literally the same. This is depicted here. You see the in-segment late lumen loss distribution, the cumulative frequency on the left side, and you see the, the, the temporal uh, distribution of in-segment late lumen loss on the right side. You see here all these little uh, buttons. These were the angiographies for the different groups. We had not a planned angiography at six or nine months. This was just all over the place. But there's no signal that one um, one uh, strategy is uh, different to the other one. Um, these are the box plots of the raw data at angiography for in-segment uh, in late lumen loss, diameter stenosis, and minimal lumen diameter. And um, these were, were all the same. This was uh, at about half a year after the, the, the index intervention. And one very striking finding was that we had a couple of uh, acute thrombotic vessel occlusions in the drug, drug eluting stent group and none in the drug coated balloon group. So um, in, in, in eight patients, there was a stent thrombosis a definite stent thrombosis because we saw that in the angiography. Five of these patients were treated with a signed stent and three with a toxic stent. And the clinical uh, presentation was quite ugly with uh, stemis, non-stemis, unstable angina or uh, an uh, acute heart failure. All but one patient was on dual antiplatelet therapy. 
Um, a very important uh, topic is, is death. Um, there has been lots of discussions about death in, in paclitaxel treated, um, treated patients and uh, we did um, uh, um, a look or we had a look at our causes of death in the basket small 2 trial. Um, 25 of our patients died during the, the first year of follow-up. This is a rate of 3.3%. And 17 of these um, patients had a cardiac death and eight patients a non-cardiac death. This, is, um, this was our cr critical event committee uh, that was adjudicating all these events. Of the non-cardiac death, we had five cancers. Uh, it was a very old population, with, which was not uh, very healthy. One bleeding was a gastrointestinal hemorrhage, one suicide, and one stroke. And regarding the cardiac death, we had um, five uh, different deaths and 12 sudden or unknown death. These 12 sudden and unknown death, these were people dying at home, in the nursery home, uh, of unknown reason. There was no angiography, there was no autopsy, there was just not a reason for death. Um, and because we were very conservative in adjudicating these events, we said that unknown deaths are uh, cardiac death. The other cardiac death, these five deaths, these were four patients with heart failure and one patient with a pericardial tamponade. Of course, this is a bleeding, but our uh, critical event committee said pericardial tamponade is a cardiac death, um, which is uh, probably right. And if we look at these 12 sudden or unknown death, there uh, was um, nine patients in the DCB group and three patients in the DS group. And this is uh, what, what has caused a little bit of discussions. You, you might know that our patients, our DCB patients, they were not virgin patients regarding the uh, coronary angiography or the, 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 the coronary vessels. Uh, most of them were treated in the same or in the same session or before or afterwards with stents, not only DCB. So it was a, a clinical trial. And uh, we had a look at this and there was just one patient with a DCB only strategy and eight patients with a combined uh, strategy. And um, eight, from these eight patients, three had a bailout stent during the same intervention, was one of these 19 patients with, um, in, in the orange curve uh, I showed you before. Two patients had at the, at the same session another stent in an other vessel. This was allowed in the trial. And three patients had a couple of weeks before another stent inserted in another vessel. So at the end, uh, we, have, we have a mixed picture and um, it is different, difficult to say uh, whether we have a problem in, uh, in, in terms of a, a, a problem with the DS or the DCB. Um, but if you look at the, the data before, as I showed you uh, with, the, uh, with the stent thrombosis, I think the conclusion is easy here. This is my summary um, regarding clinical endpoints up to 12 months. The DCB are non-inferior to DS in small vessel disease with similar event rates for both groups. Immediately after the procedure, there is some more lumen gain and less diameter stenosis in DS as compared with DCB. However, similar late lumen loss in both treatment arms up to one year is present in our angiographic analysis. And the difference in diameter stenosis between the two groups is getting smaller um, when compared with baseline angiography. And the most striking result were these acute vessel uh, closures in the DES group, whereas we did not have any, anything uh, similar in the DCP group. And at the end, I showed you that uh, mortality uh, is, is, is mostly due to sudden um, cardiac death, but this is unknown which was the exact cause. And um, we uh, think that um, the DCB only strategy is safe. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, uh, Rabban, for this very nice overview and for sharing in, in great detail the uh, details of uh, adverse outcomes. Uh, any uh, questions from the uh, audience? Just raise your hands and come to a microphone if you have a question. Yeah, one over here on the left. So um, you said that, that you were um, 
during the APT for four weeks in the in the drug coated balloon uh, population. But when this patient came from an, a non STEMI presentation, for example, wouldn't that be uh, sensitive to keep for a 12 month the APT? Uh, the same way as you would with a non revascularized uh, mm. non STEMI, for example, what do you do in those situations? Uh, this is correct. We uh, did not say that uh, in, in um, ACS patients the, we were treating with 12 months of uh, prasugrel or ticrocolor. Yes. So there, there seems to be no interaction with those uh, st possible st thrombosis and the, and the DAPT, right? Um, no, um, of these eight patients that had uh, this stent thrombosis, seven were on, on dual antiplatelet therapy, and one patient, uh, he stopped uh, the therapy because of surgery. Thanks. Okay, maybe time for one more question. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. We are dealing here with uh, a small vessel, and we know stents doesn't work in a small vessel to, to start with, and we, we noticed that we had increased thrombosis or uh, occlusion in the stent. So to get the, the idea and uh, get uh, uh, to, in order to persuade ourselves that the drug eluting balloon uh, works better or probably safer, shouldn't we have uh, either a sham uh, arm or at least simple balloon, just uh, balloon angioplasty arm where to compare the results so we know that's safer? Well, this is an excellent question. Uh, in an ideal world, I, I would do that. Uh, I, sh I think sham procedures are the best for clinical trials, but it's, uh, it's difficult to do a clinical trial uh, with uh, such, a, such a design. Um, I, I would love to do that, but uh, I think there's an ethical problem at the moment um, based on the data I showed you. Um, it's, it was not possible just to, to put uh, plain balloons um, and uh, it's also difficult to, uh, to perform a sham procedure guided uh, um, uh, randomized study. I think this is difficult. Okay, thanks, Rabban, for that. We're, we're running short on time, and so maybe just one uh, brief question. Regarding late events that we saw in Katsanas and a few different things, what type of late follow-up have you planned for your patients, or have you amended the protocol, or was late follow-up planned anyway? Uh, we plan to perform a three-year follow-up. This uh, data is getting collected at the mo a moment, and I hope next year we will know more. Okay, <coughs> great. Thanks for that. So um, I think we'll move on now uh, to the next uh, presentation, uh, which is from Thomas, and he's going to talk to us on uh, DCB only in uh, de novo large uh, coronary vessels, uh, concentrating on a couple of studies. Uh, so we're very interested in this presentation. Thank you, <coughs> uh, dear colleagues and friends. So we will move now down to the large vessels from smaller ones. I would like to start with a, a case here and uh, before going to the clinical trials. This is a middle-aged men, heart failure, presentation, three-vessel coronary artery disease, and uh, two of the vessels were treated conventionally with uh, DS, but then we had this uh, total occlusion of uh, CERC and then we decided after pre to treat this with uh, DCB. It was a five minute procedure. And then six months later, this patient underwent coronary angio and you can see and appreciate the enlargement of the target vessel and a very nice long-term result. So basically, uh, DCP only PCI is different from uh, DS uh, implantation in small and also in large, larger vessels. So you have to tolerate the more suboptimal uh, immediate uh, result of the PCI. You have uh, A to B type dissections. And, uh, uh, but if you wait for a couple of months, you have vessel healing and uh, most of the dissections have uh, disappeared. And what is important, you have vessel enlargement. Uh, the vessel closure risk, as we have heard, is, is really low in the registry studies and also in the randomized ones. And what is very important in bleeding risk patients that you can stop uh, DAPT immediately in case of, of bleeding, which is not possible after stenting. The current uh, guidelines, they don't recommend using DCP for de novo lesions because of the lack of uh, randomized trials. <coughs> Uh, before going to the randomized trials, uh, I showed uh, uh, large registry trials uh, which included uh, de novo lesions. And we have already over 3,000 uh, 
lesions treated uh, with uh, a de novo uh, balloon angioplasty uh, with uh, DCB. And uh, quite many of these studies have also uh, involved uh, larger vessels, uh, especially our own registry where we had 80% uh, over uh, 2.75 diameter uh, vessels. Uh, and which, which is remarkable in the, these re registries, the, both the maze rate and TLR rate have been low. TLR equals to 1 to 5 percent and maze to, uh, from uh, 5 to uh, 10 percent. But of course with the registry studies you cannot uh, have a recommendation in the guidelines. So the first randomized study I will cover is the PEPCAT uh, NSTEMI study presented by Bruno uh, last year uh, at the DCT uh, meeting. And uh, this was a prospective controlled uh, multi-center randomized open labor non-inferiority study comparing stent treatment uh, with uh, the DCP only method in non-STEMI patients. So the key, key uh, inclusion criteria were uh, NSTEMI with uh, symptoms and troponin elevation and identifiable uh, culprit lesion in a uh, coronary angiogram. Uh, the key, key exclusion criteria were shock, ST elevation, myocardial infarction, indication for bypass, uh, and so on. The uh, primary uh, endpoint in this study was uh, target lesion failure uh, at uh, nine months, comprising of cardiac or uh, unknown death, myocardial infarction, or uh, TLR. The key secondary endpoints were uh, total maze, comprising of colcos, mortality, infarction, TLR, uh, or stroke. And there, there were also uh, secondary clinical end endpoints listed here. So uh, perhaps the, the critique uh, towards this trial can be uh, summarized here because the study was uh, started uh, in back, to, uh, back in 2013, and uh, by that time BMS was uh, quite widely used in also in ACS patients, but uh, uh, the recommendations changed and uh, recruitment in this trial was uh, slow, and they, they had to change the control arm to DES in, in between the trial. And uh, the DCP group was uh, second place of, of B. Browns. These are the baseline uh, demographics of the uh, patients, and uh, you have uh, 2000, uh, 210 patients, and uh, basically the uh, groups were uh, similar, you know, with no differences. These are the procedural data. <clears throat> you can uh, appreciate the change in the protocol so that about half of the patients were treated with BMS and uh, less than half uh, with uh, DES. Uh, BMS was used as uh, a bailout stand in, in about 8% of the cases, and uh, the DCP uh, mean diameter was uh, 2.85 millimeters, so these were um, moderately uh, large vessels uh, in this trial. These are the results of this trial. Uh, if you look at the total maze, uh, it's uh, about 7% at uh, nine months time point and uh, double in, in the uh, stent group. But uh, this was not a statistically significant finding. Uh, actually, uh, sorry, the uh, primary endpoint was uh, target lesion failure and the maze was uh, a secondary endpoint. And in terms of uh, target lesion failure, uh, the trend was very similar with uh, about 4% uh, uh, TL, TLF uh, at nine months in the DCP group. But the, the study met the uh, primary result showing non-inferiority of DCP treatment against uh, two stent, type, stent types uh, at uh, nine months. Uh, in the intention to treat analysis, both for the primary endpoint of TLR and uh, TLF and uh, total maze. Here you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves of the two groups. Uh, he, he, this is the TLF, uh, and uh, there was a uh, slight trend uh, uh, 
towards a better outcome with uh, DCP treatment. And uh, to, uh, actually the difference was even more clear in the MACE uh, endpoint and uh, almost reached uh, statistical significance during the first year follow-up. Then this is the per protocol analysis differentiating the two uh, stent types and uh, as expected, the BMS uh, is, is going here da da down and then uh, DS group in the middle and uh, DCP group here, but uh, the groups are far too uh, uh, little and uh, it's that the study is not powered to see differences between the groups. So the conclusions from the first randomized uh, study in, in large vessels are uh, that um, treatment of coronary uh, denoval lesions with DCP in patients presenting with NSTEMI was non-inferior to stent treatment. And uh, <clears throat> this study supports the concept of DCP-only uh, uh, method in coronary denoval disease <clears throat> in patients with uh, uh, ACS. But we obviously need uh, in this setting uh, uh, maybe a larger and uh, definitely a larger study comparing uh, DCP to uh, current generation DES. But then we will move on down to the other trial which has been done in Finland uh, in five centers and I'm very happy to tell you that this uh, will be published in the Lancet uh, within a couple of next weeks. So the background for this study is that we know that uh, bleeding is an uh, independent risk factor for death after PCI. And uh, <clears throat> in this large meta-analysis, it was found that uh, the hazard ratio is uh, almost seven within the first year if, the, if there will be a bleed after PCI. And from the NOAC studies, we know that uh, the patients on NOAC uh, and also, of course, on warfarin tend to bleed after the uh, PCI during the first year. And, uh, and uh, the prevention of bleeding must be one essential goal after PCI in the future clinical practice. <clears throat> so uh, the major advantage of DCP only uh, method or strategy is that uh, DAPT duration can be kept short. The usual recommendation uh, currently is one month. And as we uh, later hear, positive remodeling of the treated vessel may occur. And the hypothesis of this trial was that uh, the DCP-only strategy is non-inferior to PCI with BMS in patients with a bleeding risk. And uh, BMS, BMS was the control group in this trial as well, because uh, when we started this trial in, in 2013, it was the only uh, stent type uh, in the guidelines uh, which was indicated in, in the bleeding risk patients. So we included both uh, patients with uh, stable angina and ACS, and uh, uh, the reference diameter of the vessel uh, was 2.5 till uh, 4.0 millimeters. We didn't want to include tiny vessels in this uh, trial. And the patient had to have a bleeding risk factor, and uh, I will come back to this later on. Uh, these are the ex exclusion criteria for the study, uh, uh, as uh, similar to uh, basket small two trial, the randomization was done after successful uh, predilatation and uh, instant restenosis, unprotected left main CTO, STEMI, as two small or big vessels were the major uh, exclusion criteria. And we didn't uh, in, uh, include patients with uh, bifurcation lesions requiring two stent uh, technique. The primary endpoint of the study was MACE at uh, uh, nine months and the key secondary endpoints were TLR at uh, nine months and uh, uh, three years and as well as MACE at three years. According to the power calculation we should have included uh, over 500 patients but because of slow rec rec recruitment in this study as well we had to prematurely terminate the study after about uh, four years of, of uh, recruitment. And we had five centers in, in Finland. So uh, randomization was done after predilatation using, uh, uh, according to the International 
consensus uh, statement uh, document and uh, the mean diameter of the uh, vessels were approximately three millimeters. We only had two percent of bailout stenting and uh, this can be explained by the fact that uh, the randomization was done after successful uh, bread lotation. Dup, dura dup duration was uh, one month in the staple CAD and uh, six months after ACS in both groups. Here are the baseline characteristics. You, you may appreciate that uh, these patients were about 10 years older than in normal uh, stent uh, studies. And uh, they were, the demographics were otherwise similar, but there were more diabetics in the BMS group but by chance, but uh, uh, insulin-dependent uh, diabetes didn't uh, differ between the groups. And uh, <coughs> ACS patients uh, pre uh, were about half of the population. These are the inclusion criteria and uh, distribution of them. So the major inclusion crit uh, criterion was anticoagulation, about 50 to 60 percent. Uh, over half of the patients were elderly, over 80 years old. The one third had uh, anemia. These are the target vessels. It's a normal distribution, mostly LAD and then RCA. We had bifurcations, we had calcified lesions, we had cut in balloon, rotational atherotomy a little bit, and this, this is the main uh, device diameter. Uh, it's very important that we had uh, two thirds of the vessels were larger than the, uh, equal or larger than three millimeters uh, according to the device size. And uh, <coughs> uh, most of the patients had only one device per uh, PCI. These are the main results uh, of the inten intention to treat analysis. The MACE rate was really low, only 1% in the DCP group uh, at uh, nine months and about 14% uh, in the BMS group, comprising of zero TLR in the DCP group and uh, six cases in the BMS group. And, uh, uh, there were also less uh, infarctions in the DCP group. Bleeding, bleedings didn't differ because the DIBT duration was the same in the trial in, in both arms. So the last couple of slides showing the maze curves. This is uh, uh, the couple of main curves. This is the uh, primary endpoint maze. And you can see that the difference uh, lasts uh, uh, up to uh, three years of follow-up. This is highly superior and obviously highly non-inferior. <coughs> and this is the TLR uh, couple of Meyer. Uh, during the first year, there's a clear difference, which is statistically significant, but there is a little uh, catch-up catch phenomenon in the, in the DCP group during the follow-up. And which is uh, very important and interesting at this time, is that we, we did a post hoc uh, analysis because of this uh, meta-analysis in the periphery and found that actually the total mortality was uh, higher in the BMS group as, as compared to drug-coded balloon group uh, in the whole population and uh, after also uh, uh, there was a strong trend after adjustment for diabetes and CV mortality was uh, in both methods, it was uh, lower in, in the DCP group uh, as compared to the BMS group. But this is only a hypothesis generating because it's, it was not a uh, predefined uh, endpoint. So I would like to conclude uh, this trial that this uh, strategy using DCP only without any standing is safe and efficient novel option in done lesions of uh, patients at high bleeding risk and it was superior uh, to BMS, both in terms of maize and uh, with zero TLR, and this uh, persisted uh, three years. And um, uh, this was the first uh, RCT investigating the DCP only uh, strategy in, in large vessels. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks uh, very much for a very nice uh, presentation. And uh, we have about a minute uh, and uh, for questions, and uh, that's great. I was going to call on our two panelists, uh, Franz and Simon. So, Franz, you're, uh, you have a question. 
Um, Thomas, uh, I'm uh, one of the last remainings who uh, started with PDCA without anything else. Um, uh, and uh, if I recall this, uh, we had uh, acute vessel occlusions with PDCA um, just in the first few days. So do you think that uh, even four weeks is already a long period for dual antiplatelet with the therapy? Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I think that uh, you're referring to maybe the next step and the study uh, comparing DCP against DS. And uh, the current DS are so good that uh, in terms of MACE, it's very difficult to compete. So I think to get the full benefit of DCP therapy in anticoagulated patients, we should a little bit shorten the uh, DAPT duration, for example, giving the only the loading dose. Um, Thank you. Great presentation. Well, what I think what's very interesting to see and what we have look uh, under ongoing discussion about mortality, we have s seen no signal at all in all the uh, ISR trials. We have uh, clearly lower mortality in the debut trial, the same picture as in PEPCAD and STEMI, and we have seen in basket small that besides one patient, all patients that died had crossover to stenting. So I think this is very important to note that we see no mortality signal at all in the coronaries, and we see, in contrast, the opposite. And I think it's very, very important to note. Okay. Yeah, um, great. Well, thanks very much. I think we're right on time. So if there's no other questions, and I don't see any, we'll uh, move on to the final presentation. And it's my uh, pleasure now to invite Franz Kleber, who's going to talk on uh, positive vessel remodeling after DCB only, Franz. Thank you, Robert. Bruno, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to talk about this topic here. Um, this is my conflicts of interest. I show you this slide of uh, PCR 2012. Um, and this was the first time we uh, officially thought about this idea. And I said, does local drug delivery together with balloon angioplasty induce positive remodeling? And this was based on cases we saw and we discussed in the, uh, at that time, German consensus group. Um, and now we are seven years after this initial slide. We uh, saw cases like this, and this is actually from the... Um, uh, Euro intervention cover page, and you see uh, on the left the uh, obtuse marginal branch uh, ostial lesion. Uh, in the middle, you see post uh, uh, balloon angioplasty and DCB. Um, not a little, uh, not a lot of change. On, on the right side, you see the positive remodeling four months out. Cases like this, or uh, let me show you the next case. Uh, or like this, also uh, from the very early days with the uh, osteal uh, LAD and distal left main lesion, before, after, and four months follow-up, you see the nice positive remodeling in these cases. Now, we went, when we had this experience, uh, we discussed it in the group, and I especially uh, talked to Bruno and said, well, uh, don't you have the same experience? Shouldn't we... Uh, uh, do a study on this uh, because you always remember the best cases you ever treated. Um, so we decided to look at a consecutive uh, series of patients, half of the patients done by uh, Bruno's lab and half in our lab, um, because we wanted, from our, uh, today's perspective, we wanted to explain why the target lesion revascularization rate we saw already at this time and this uh, even uh, much larger now, is so low. In mostly small vessels, a target lesion revascularization rate of 2.7% is certainly lower than with the best DS we have. So um, before I uh, show you the uh, very early study, I want to remind you that uh, the uh, mechanism of free stenosis in uh, uh, PDCA is different from stenting. So the main mechanism is the vessel shrinkage. You overdilate the vessel um, uh, initially um, because you put a 3O balloon in a 0.3 uh, vessel residual lumen. 
and uh, the vessel gets initially larger and during the healing process you have the same thing what happens with any wound it shrinks and uh, the shrinkage is the main mechanism near intimal hyperplasia is also present after PDCA but it is uh, only a small percentage uh, on contrary to, to stenting so um, Bruno and myself uh, we decided to look at this consecutive series of patients and what was important because it was an angiographic subset of uh, uh, observations um, we had to exclude that this is a vascular tone effect what we see when we have the follow-up so we looked um, at the lesion uh, and a uh, few millimeters beyond the lesion and we looked at the reference uh, uh, diameter of this vessel but we also looked at a non-target vessel to exclude the vascular tone effect. So there was the circumflex which we looked at when we treated the LAD and vice versa. Now when you uh, look at these results and the segments A, B and C are um, uh, the lesion and the balloon uh, segment and beyond the balloon segment we always see the same. We see a uh, albeit small but clear further luminal in, uh, increase from post-intervention to follow up and the average follow up was four months. Uh, when you look at the reference diameters in all these uh, data, you see the reference diameter does not change. If you look at uh, segment A, you see reference diameter is 2.6 throughout the observation. And uh, completely down here, you see the non-target vessel in the last line, and you see the non-target vessel does not change. So it's not a vascular tone effect, it's a real remodeling effect. And this is the remodeling we found in this study. Uh, for the first time in PCI, we were able to describe that after end of your PCI, there's a further luminal increase in, uh, in the vessels uh, you treated. Now, one of the first one to take up this me message was Tudor Perner from Jena, and he showed a late loss, a negative late loss, a late luminal gain of 0.13 millimeters in a, a diligently uh, investigated group with FFR and OCT and angiography. Here you see the, uh, on the right side, you see the further luminal increase in red at follow-up as compared to the green uh, PCI result. On the left side, you see the amount of further luminal increase. And again, in the reference diameter, no change. And then he compared this with a, uh, a f uh, earlier study with uh, a DES. And you see, uh, right at the end of the PCI, the DES result is, of course, uh, better or larger. And uh, uh, the uh, negative remodeling of the DES group and the positive remodeling of the DCB group leads to the same late result after six months. Now recently, and he presented this at the uh, German Cardiovascular Society just a few weeks ago, um, he extended his experience in the Octopus 3 study, uh, again with the same very diligent method with FFR and, and OCT, and he compared the DCB with the bioresorbable scaffold, and I think these data are also interesting. Uh, on the contrary to the other studies, he randomized his 59 patients before lesion preparation. And then he, uh, of course, had to decide where can we use a DCB, where can we use a BRS. So the lesion preparation is pretty similar, as we know. So the definition he used for the DCB application as a successful predilatation was a residual stenosis less than 30%, an FFR of at least 0.80. So this was new, and a TIMI 3 flow. He did not really talk uh, about uh, grade of dissection, and he could use the DCP in 23 of 31 cases, and he could use the uh, bioresorbable scaffold in 24 of 28 cases. Now this is his result, as expected, uh, right after the uh, uh, intervention, um, the uh, BRS had a, a bigger, MLD than the DCB, but after nine months it turned around. So the DCB had the larger uh, diameter <coughs> and the late loss, again in his study, was negative. So he had a late gain in the Z DCB group and a late loss in the BRS group. And the target lesion failure rate 
was uh, very much different, but it was a small uh, study, so it became not significant, but the net luminal gain was a significant difference. The other group that took up the me message very early was the Korean group, uh, Dr. Shin's group, and as you see here with Ivels on the right side, you see there is a further, quite uh, impressive further luminal increase, um, uh, uh, or luminal areas are this, and uh, on the left side you see there is no change in plug volume. The same group also studied this with OCT, especially in bifurcations, and I think this is a very important and interesting result. So if we say after DCB the whole vessel gets larger, of course the ostium of the side branch should also get larger, and that's exactly what she showed uh, with OCT, and you see in the uh, uh, picture above is right after the intervention, and the follow-up at six months is uh, down, and you see uh, uh, very nicely the uh, increase in the ostial um, uh, in the ostium of the side branch, and when you quantify this, the uh, uh, side branch had a luminal area increase from 1.0 to 1.4 square millimeters. And recently, Dr. Yu from Shenyang in China uh, took up the message, and they studied uh, 595 lesions. Um, and followed the patients for 10.7 months. And you see here, there is in smaller and in larger vessels, there is a luminal increase in the smaller ones from 1.6 to 1.75, and in the smaller, uh, in the larger vessels uh, to the same degree. There's another study, the DEPSIDE trial, also a small trial, uh, uh, studying uh, the uh, Neil Pax uh, bifurcational stent and using the Danubio DCB for the side branch. And when you look here at the data in the main branch proximal and main branch distal, you see there is a luminal loss. Proximal main branch from 2.6 to 2.0. Distal main branch 2.2 to 1.5. But in the DCB treated side branch, there is no luminal loss, 1.52, 1.55. So, uh, again, the uh, late loss uh, with the drug-coated balloon is much uh, in, in favor. Um, if you look at all the trials that have been uh, presented, uh, looking at specifically at uh, uh, late loss or uh, late gain, you see that the majority of these cases either had no late loss uh, or a uh, uh, late gain. Let me show you uh, a few of these uh, impressive cases. This was a 74-year-old lady. She was admitted for unstable angina. I had a long history of uh, coronary disease with uh, diverse interventions from 1996 to 2014, with, uh, mostly with stents. And uh, she presented with this, these two lesions, a high-grade lesion of the OM, uh, a bit behind a stent, and uh, another high-grade lesion of the uh, diagonal, of the first diagonal branch. And here you see the result of the predilatation, and um, the OM uh, has a, what we say, a haziness, uh, so type A dissection, and the uh, diagonal branch has a B dissection, it looks ugly, but there's no con persistent contrast staining, so this is a B dissection. So we treated these two with the drug-coated balloon, and this is the immediate result. And now we go on and see uh, the result after four months. And you see the nice remodeling. The remodeling occurs already after some six weeks. It's uh, almost done after two to three months, and we stu mostly studied our patients after four months. You see a nice result in both branches, and uh, you see you don't have to worry about the B dissections. Now, um, many uh, asked me, uh, yeah, well, four months is a rather early follow-up. It's not an early follow-up for a PTCA procedure. It's an early follow-up for a DES procedure. Um, because the healing has occurred at that time. So we had here a later follow-up at 
27 months, you see the diagonal branch looking very nice. And here you see the OM, 27 months follow-up, no problem. This is a case uh, with a bifurcational stenosis with already sluggish flow in, in both end branches. On, uh, in the next, uh, you see the early result after uh, treatment of uh, the uh, main proximal and distal main vessel and the bifurcation, so in both directions with the DCB. And on the right side, four months follow up. Here you see very nicely the positive remodeling, which you can almost rely on. And uh, finally, this case, this was a, a case which was very difficult, a recent case. Um, this uh, 84 years old male had not only renal failure, but he also had a Mueller pro proliferative disorder with severe thrombocytopenia. So uh, we needed to avoid a stent. And uh, he had resting angina three to four times a day. And we watched him, actually, we watched him for two weeks because, because we didn't want to treat him. You see the severe calcifications uh, in his LAD. And it was uh, our opinion that uh, probably we get a severe dissection if we treat this patient. Now, what did we do? Um, on the left side, you see we, we established flow. Uh, on the right side, you see the three months follow up. This case was done with lithotripsy, and we could very smoothly just apply the drug coated balloon to the very distal vessel. You see, there's a, a, a little bit uh, of a restenosis down there, but he was completely free of angina at that time, so we didn't touch the, the vessel further. And finally, this case here, because I think it's also an educative case. Um, Enstemi in a 76-year-old male, uh, severe angina, um, and uh, um, this is the running picture here. So we pre-treated, we pre-dilated it in both directions, and now you have a intermediate result in the LAD and not a nice result in the ostial diagonal branch. So what would you do? Um, I think uh, uh, Robert already showed us what to do. Uh, you use a scoring balloon, and then you get this result. And now you can use your drug-coated balloon here. <clears throat> and this here is a six weeks follow-up. You see already some positive remodeling at six weeks. Um, but lesion preparation is most important also to induce the positive remodeling. So let me summarize. In a database of 3,890 uh, 3, patients, the target lesion revascularization rate after DCB only, PCI for de novo lesions of mostly small vessels was only 2.7%. In 13 studies addressing late lumen loss or late lumen gain after DCB only PCI in de novo stenosis, six showed no luminal uh, changes, so uh, clearly less than 0.1 millimeter. Five showed luminal gain between 0.13 and 0.20 millimeters, and two showed uh, late lumen loss of only less than, two point, uh, than 0 0.25. So if late loss, it was probably uh, uh, unimportant, unless you do not predilate enough. So my conclusion is positive vessel remodeling or late lumen gain occurring over two to four months post-PCI is a unique finding after coronary angioplasty with paclitaxel coated balloons and is compensating for vessel shrinkage and near intimal proliferation. It has been confirmed in a number of trials with different technologies, angiography, IVOS, OCT, and is the main reason for the very low incidence of target lesion revascularization with this PCI technology. Thank you. So, Franz, uh, thank you as ever for um, a great uh, presentation, case-based, I think, uh, which is the spirit of the meeting here. Are there questions from the audience uh, with regard to the cases that Franz showed or the techniques that he uses? I mean, if not, I, I mean, a couple of points that we could uh, discuss. Uh, osteal lesions. Uh, tell me about your experience of uh, osteal lesions. Um, some people are worried without a, a vessel scaffold that you have a, a lot of recoil in osteal lesions. Uh, 
tell us about maybe your experience. What about Ostium of RCA and Left Main? Do they behave differently? Um, we don't have a, a lot of data on this. Uh, I think aorto osteal lesions don't behave very good. Uh, I tend to not use a DCB technology for this. Other osteal lesions like osteal LADs, uh, osteal circumflex, uh, are quite good, quite good, especially LAD, where they don't have a, uh, a, a, such a uh, angulation. Um, I did a lot of osteal LADs, I have to say and uh, almost all uh, behaved very good. I tried to use a scoring balloon from the beginning and do not predilate without a scoring, and that's why I uh, get probably uh, quite good results. And um, the other osteal lesions of side branches, we, uh, if it's really only osteal and the flow is good, we leave alone, and uh, they fare pretty good, but that's what we do with stenting as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any experience or comments on, on freezing? So some people think that uh, directly after the, when you do balloon only approach with a regular balloon angioplasty that you get uh, more prolapse immediately after the procedure if you wait an hour or something and with drug coated balloon. When you look at some of the studies, DCB against plain balloon angioplasty, the acute gain seems to be a little bit better with drug coated balloon. Uh, any comments on that? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, we see that, but I think um, part of is is uh, that we tend to use a duck balloon for, as you also said, for a minute, and we know from the early PDCA days, if you dilate a little longer, if you give yourself a little more time, uh, your at least your early result is better. Yeah, I think uh, that reflects uh, my opinion too. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, I don't see any other burning questions, so we're right on time, and uh, we'll uh, thank all the speakers for staying on time, and then leave uh, Simon to tell us about uh, his take-home messages from the session. Thank you very much. My name's Simon Axel. I'm from the UK. Um, I get the bit where I don't have to present any data, which is just great. And apparently, according to Bruno, I also get the last word, which has got to be a first, certainly in my house. Um, so some conclusions on what we've been talking about today. Those are my conflicts. Um, so very briefly, my view of what we've been talking about today, I think the paclitaxel late mortality thing, it should be looked at, but I suspect in a very English way of saying things, it's a storm in a teacup. I don't think it will come to anything. Um, from the point of view of Robert's very nice talk about lesion preparation, I think really good lesion preparation is the key to all angioplasty. And I think drug looting stents are quite forgiving, but actually there are reasons why you still have to do a really good angioplasty before you put a stent in. And we've certainly learned that from um, all the scaffolds. And I think with DCB, the, the phrase I quite like to coin is optimal balloon angioplasty. You do all the work, and then you put the drug in at the end. And DCBs against stents, which we looked at with um, basket small two, and then at the end, stent in debut studies from, that Raban and Tumas presented, I think, I think it's all looking good. I think if you can be as good as a drug looting stent at a year, um, we know, for example, from Euro intervention data in the last 12 months, if you have a drug looting stent in any vessel, at 10 years, your TLR rate is around 15%, and your stent thrombosis rate is 3 to 5%. Late lumen gain, um, Franz has shown some beautiful pictures and talked very nicely through the data, and essentially, as he pretty much said, you rely on it when you're doing DCBs. The advantages of DCBs, I think there are... Too many to put on this slide, so I haven't, but very briefly, short dual antiplatelet therapy, but much easier um, angioplasty. It simplifies your procedure no end. It's fantastic for bifurcations. Generally, you only have to treat one, one branch rather than both. Uh, you get normal geometry coming back. You get normal endothelial function in due course coming back. You don't get any of the very late problems that you get with a permanent implant. So where do we go next? So, um, I'm going to break some of the rules of the DCB consensus people. I'll show you a couple of our cases. 
this is the sort of thing that we're now doing in our labs, really on the back of all the work that the people that have gone before have shown. Uh, so this is a CTO of a pretty um, osteo LAD, and as you can see from the cross-filling injections, it's ending in a rather um, complicated LAD diagonal bifurcation. So luckily the first wire went straight down the diagonal, so I ignored all those CTO gurus, just ballooned it and then put a wire down the LAD. That's a large scoring balloon. You can see it's a scoring balloon because of the little sort of triangle of the two wires at the end. So that was a 4-0 scoring balloon, left main stem, two LAD across the diagonal branch, which you can obviously see because of the wire at the side. We then used a large drug-coated balloon. I've termed that some recoil. Um, that's probably not the 30% that they would say in the consensus guidelines. In the other views, it looked a bit better, and I thought, well, if we're stenting this, we've got all the issues of where do you drop it at the top, where do you drop it at the bottom, what do you do with that diagonal branch that doesn't look very happy. So we left it. Uh, two years later, he came back with some symptoms that he thought might be angina. So you need to guess which vessel is going to go down. Neither of them. So that's the late looming gain that this chap had two years later. So that's quite a nice, sustainable, uh, long-term outcome, I'd say. OK, I've got another case. This becomes slightly more outrageous for you, maybe. This is uh, an 85-year-old lady who was admitted for a diagnostic angiogram, and she had quite bad angina. So she had some pictures taken and uh, was taken off the table and told, you really need an operation. So as is standard practice in the UK, she sat on the ward for a few weeks while we talked to the surgeons. And by the time the surgeons got back to us, she'd had uh, an end STEMI. So now the surgeons said, she'll have to wait another six weeks, thanks very much. So we thought that wasn't acceptable, and she went back to the lab for angioplasty to this obviously true distal left main stem bifurcation. Just in case you wondered whether it was tight, so that's a different view. So we've thought two wires were probably a good idea here. So we've got non-compliant balloon. We start nearly all our DCB work now with non-compliance, if not with cutting or scoring. So there's two non-compliant into the LAD, same balloon into the CERC, because I'm obviously trying to save money. There's a 3 non-compliant balloon. That's the result so far. Probably not very good. We thought we needed some cutting or scoring now. So there's the 4-0 NSE Alpha, which is semi-compliant scoring balloon. So you can see there's a chunk at the ostium of the circumflex where there's some calcium that's being a little bit uh, difficult to dilate. So we pushed the balloon on a bit further and tried again and again. And there's still a little bit of an indent, and you can sort of see that ridge of calcium there. And at this point in time, we thought, well, that's probably good enough lumen to get keep her out of hospital. So we took the same NSA alpha into the LAD, and I think this is more like what you normally see in bifurcations when you're just ballooning them. There's a tiny bit of osteal um, lack of give in the balloon, but probably enough. So that's the acute result in that view. You can see there's some dissection around the ostium of the circumflex. There's a little bit of contrast that hangs up for a little while afterwards, and then it clears. So this is quite an important one from the point of view of do you stent or not. So normally we'd only work in one view, but we thought we'd maybe take a couple more. So there's the spider view. The only bit that's not great really is the ostium of the circumflex still. So I sort of think in these, in these sort of situations I apply the, well, if I was doing a single stent strategy and I ended up with that, would I be happy or not? If she's got Timmy 3 flow everywhere, I probably would be. That's the cranial view. So the left main stem's come up quite nicely. It's only really the ostium of the cirque that's not perfect. We thought it was good enough and anything else was going to get really complicated. So there's a 4-0 DCB left main stem to LAD, another 4-0 DCB left main stem to cirque. That's the acute result. What do you have to do now? You have to decide whether you're happy to take those wires out or not. So... That's the wire out shot on the right. So we got her from that on the left to that on the right with two non-compliant balloons, one NSE alpha, and then two DCBs. That was just over a year ago. I've shown this a few times, usually to outrage and usually to people saying, why don't you have a follow-up angiogram? 
Well, she didn't want to come back for a follow-up angiogram at the age of 85, but very recently she did come back with angina. So this is now what her left system looks like. Everything looks great, with the exception of the ostium of the circumflex. So, do you think that's the cause of her angina? Bearing in mind it was really calcified before, we pressure wired it, somebody just said that in the audience, we pressure wired it, it was profoundly negative. It was a right coronary artery that needed fixing. So, actually, um, maybe some physiology sometimes is quite helpful. I don't know whether physiology earlier on in that case would have been helpful. Um, and generally, left main stems without stents, before anybody asks me, no, we don't image them. So, my conclusions. Uh, why use a stent? I think when you're doing angioplasty, you need to think to yourself why you need a stent rather than why you don't need a stent. The next revolution in PCI, I think it's prime time for DCB only. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Simon, for the last word. <laughs> Um, I have to, we have to thank you for, for staying that long, um, uh, for your participation, for the questions, for the discussions, and um, have a good night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay.